This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Waste only, how the plastics industry is fighting to keep polluting the world. That's the name of a new investigation by journalist Sharon Lerner. She reveals how corporations in the United States are refusing to turn to more sustainable materials, with most of the country's plastic waste ending up in landfills or scattered around the world. According to the report, in 2015, the United States only recycled 9 percent of its plastic waste, and since then, that figure has dropped even lower. And fewer than 1 percent of the tens of billions of plastic bags used in the U.S. each year are recycled. For more, we're joined by Sharon Lerner, health and environment reporter for The Intercept, reporting fellow at Type Investigations. Her series, The Teflon Toxin, was a finalist for a National Magazine Award. Sharon Lerner, welcome to Democracy Now! Thanks for having me. It's How the plastics industry is fighting to keep polluting the world. Tell us what you found. Well, I think we all realize that we're surrounded by tons of plastic now, that so many things are wrapped in plastic, and, and um, there's been this sort of growing awareness that our plastic does not all end up here. And I started trying to think about why why we are where we are and why it is there's so much plastic in our world today. And the piece, uh, not surprisingly, I guess, ended up uh, in my research, I learned that there's a huge fight against uh, environmentalists who are working to uh, try to reduce plastic waste. And that is on the part of the big companies that make it and use it. So talk about the history of the plastics industry. Okay, so we began using plastic in earnest in the 50s. Production kept going up and up and up. Um, I think by 90, we were making more plastic than steel. And these days, a huge contribution to the amount of plastic we make um, is single waste, which is about half of everything, which means that, you know, minutes after it is used, it becomes trash. And the really unfortunate truth, I think, that most of us don't understand about all this plastic is that it is not recycled. Um, so right now, we're at about 9 percent of all plastic, or actually a little bit lower, but our peak was 9 percent. So over the years, the decades that we've been using all this plastic, about 80 percent of what we've used has ended up in landfills or just scattered and littered in nature, and as we now know, in the oceans. And it's a very complicated story. Part of it has to do with the fact that there's no market anymore. Uh, there never was much of one. But these days, uh, the ability to sell recycled plastic, which is what recyclers are doing, is an economic arrangement. They have to find an end use for it, and it's almost impossible for them to do it. So who represents the plastic industry? the industry alliances, and what they've been doing for decades. Yeah. So there are many um, plastic producers. Some of the biggest, it's worth noting, are, are familiar names that you don't necessarily associate with plastic, like Dow, uh, like ExxonMobil, like Chevron Phillips. These are petrochemical companies. We think of them as oil companies or oil and gas companies, but these are the same companies uh, because plastic is, in fact, made from fossil fuels. So there are two big industry groups that represent these companies. One of them is the Plastics Industry Association, known as Plastics, and the other is the American Chemistry Council, which uh, and they have an overlapping membership. And their fight has very much been to convey the message that we've got this. This is under control. There is no problem here, right? And the problem, the way that we're dealing with plastic is to recycle it. What's the problem? You take it, you use it, you put it in the recycling bin, done. But what we're learning more and more is that when it goes into the recycling bin, if it does, much of that ends up, again, in landfills or being burnt or in poor countries that aren't able to process it. Tell 
us the story uh, that you share at the beginning of your piece, how the plastics industry is fighting to keep polluting the world. You begin with the students at Westmead Elementary School. Where is that, and what are they this doing? This in Tennessee. And so these kids participated in this contest, and they were uh, trying to make the best plastic bag receptacle. So it's like a, a container for people to put plastic bags that are going to get recycled. And you can tell the kids worked really hard on this, and they gave it teeth and a little feed me sign, and they painted it green, and they won. So good for them. Right. And, you know, I have kids and I see the the desire they they have to they understand this is we don't want to throw this on the ground. We don't want to throw this in the water. We want it to go to the right place. And that's where this was coming from. Unfortunately, it gets a little more complicated because the organization that was sponsoring this contest is actually uh, an offshoot of the American Progressive Bag Alliance, which is the lobbying group that fights plastic bans. Which Wait a second. The I American very, Progressive Bag Alliance. That is what it's called. Yes. And this is a group, a lobbying group, that fights bans on plastic. It is now an offshoot of the Plastic Industry Association. Pr previously, it was part of the American Chemistry Council. And they've been really effective, not just in fighting plastic bans, but in passing what are called preemption laws that make it impossible for uh, cities and towns to ban plastic. Wait, alone. how does a how does a law ban local communities from yeah. banning plastic? This is a model that was uh, spearheaded by the group Alec, the um, American Legislative Exchange Council, right? And and their idea is that uh, they call it unity, or you know, they they want the states to have only one policy so it's not messy. But, of course, what happens is that, you know, if you live in a town or, or a, you know, a city and you are f frustrated and you take this to your, to your local government and you ban them, um, well, now you can't if the preemption law is in place. Um, and it's a successful strategy that's been used by ALEC on other issues, living wage, uh, pesticide spraying. Recently, New York passed a law. Yes. Explain this law. So it's a single-use plastic ban. Um, and San Francisco also passed well, one. Well, the entire state of California has one. And increasingly, states are taking <laughs> this uh, step. The EU, Canada also just banned single-use plastics. I think that's ultimately where we really need to go. Um, I don't think that nationally we're heading there anytime soon, which is why there's been so much focus on what's going on in the states. In your report, Sharon, you write about the infamous Cryin' Indian ad yeah. that was created in 1971 by Keep America Beautiful an anti-litter organization formed by beverage and packaging companies. The ad begins with a Native American, who actually is portrayed by an Italian-American actor, rowing down a pristine river in a wooded environment, which becomes more and more polluted. He climbs out of his canoe, walks through a garbage-littered shoreline up to a highway, where a passenger in a car throws a plastic bag full of trash out the window, which lands at his feet. The camera moves in on a close-up as a single tear runs down his cheek. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. The camera focuses in on the Native American, who is not Native American, played by Italian-Americans, cheek, and the tear rolls down it. But this is a very famous ad. Yeah. Who sponsored this? So this was uh, the um, Ad Council, but also is working with Keep America Beautiful, which is this organization, as you mentioned, that's really uh, fund, uh, founded by these beverage and packaging companies. And the thing that was really important about this ad was it really effectively shifts the onus for waste, for plastic waste and, and all sorts of litter, to the individuals, to people, as opposed to the companies that make them. And it was really important to know that the companies that were backing this and were members of Keep America Beautiful were also— um, fighting efforts to pass 
bottle bills, which effectively does put responsibility back on the companies. And this two-edged sword, like two-edged strategy, where you're, on the one hand, uh, you know, we're, we're pro-cleaning things up, and here we are, fighting the good fight to make everything clean, and on the other hand, you're fighting responsibility for the waste and putting it onto consumers has been incredibly effective and has so that ad was 1971 and we're still seeing that today. So talk about how plastics affect the world and who does it disproportionately affect? I mean we've heard about these um country size garbage plastic um heaps that are rolling through the ocean for example moving through the ocean and how does it affect the developing world as well yeah so plastic is everywhere now but it's not equally <laughs> dispersed and much of what we're offloading we're uh sending to poor countries theoretically this is for recycling. And in fact, it's been categorized that way. It's still categorized that way when we um, export it, as we were for decades, uh, for about 25 years at least, uh, to China. That's called recycled. But in fact, uh, we now know that much of that waste is not recycled. These are countries uh, that that don't have the infrastructure and ability to process it. And so we've seen the, this amazing footage of towers of plastic, islands of plastic, mountains of plastic. Um, there's an amazing film called Plastic China, which, uh, which documents the effort of uh, a couple of poor families to recycle in China. It's important to know that in 2018, we shifted, uh, because China made us, they, they instituted a new policy called the National Sword, which said, we're not taking your waste anymore, at least most of it. And so we've had to find other countries to export to. But we found them. Uh, right now, we're sending to, to 58 other countries, and many of them have no ability to deal with it. And so we're, we're really putting the burden on these poor countries. I want to turn to what's happened with Malaysia. In yes. May, it announced it was sending up to 3,000 tons of plastic waste back to the countries it came from, in an attempt to halt wealthier um, countries from dumping their used plastic under the guise of recycling. Malaysia became the world's main dumping ground for plastic refuse after China banned its import last year. The plastic is smuggled to unlicensed recycling plants from right. countries including the U.S., Britain, France, Canada, Australia, and is causing environmental problems for surrounding communities. This is the Malaysia Asian Minister of Energy, Yeo Bi Yen. So the, what the citizen of the UK believe that they send for recycling is actually dumped in our country. Malaysians, like any other developing countries, have a right to clean air, clean water, sustainable resources and clean environment to live in, just like citizens of developed nations. So that is the Malaysian Minister of Energy, uh, Sharon Lerner, talk about this. It's exciting, and it's, it's not the only country that is standing up. And in fact, um, a couple months back, the um, Basel Convention, which is uh, an international treaty governing waste, made a move to make it more difficult to export plastic to, to all member nations. And that is— uh, moving along, where it's unclear exactly how it's going to play out, but it does look like it'll be much, much more difficult for company, countries, including the U.S., to export our plastic waste. It's worth noting that the Trump administration has uh, objected to it, and it's unclear. Uh, Andrew Wheeler wrote a letter to the convention, and it's unclear what effect that will have. Sharon Lerner, can you talk about the significance of Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola saying they're pulling out of the uh, Plastics Industry Association? What does this mean? Well, that's right. It's a big deal. A couple of days after my story ran, both companies uh, acknowledged that they were leaving this uh, industry group. And this is the group known as Plastics that is the parent group of the APBA, the American Progressive Bag Alliance. And the American Pro Progressive Bag Alliance 
fights plastic bans, which is really at odds with the sustainability pledges that these companies have taken. Several groups have been pointing this out, Greenpeace, As You Sow, an investor group. And in my piece, I really talked uh, a lot about Matt Seaholm, who's the executive director of the APBA. And, and again, the American Progressive Bag <laughs> yes. Alliance. Yes. It's a bit cynical, the name, because it might suggest that it's trying to address the waste from plastic bags, but really it's doing exactly the opposite. And I attended an industry, plastic industry conference in my reporting and saw a lot of folks who are in the plastics industry genuinely distraught about their role in this pollution and grappling with it. And I have to say, Matt Seaholm was not in that category. He is aggressive. He really enjoys uh, making, positioning himself as the uh, opposite of environmentalists, the antagonist of environmentalists. He's mocked the groups. Um, and he's talked about bans dismissively as like being just based on emotion. And he, I think, went too far for some companies, which, I mean, I wanted to shine a light on this, because really the groups he's pointing out and taking issue with and mocking are not in it for the money, the way these companies all have a huge stake in this. These are groups that are genuinely trying to preserve the world. They're trying to deal with climate change, which plastic is a huge, huge uh, uh, generator of. They're trying to deal with species extinction, and they're trying to deal with the huge uh, environmental injustice of putting the consequences of all this waste on poor countries and on poor people within our own country. In your uh, piece, you talk about um, the hefty bag story. Yet another example, for fear of making people so cynical, they'll just sort of throw up their hands. Yeah. Tell us what this is all about. So the Hefty Energy Bag Program um, is this pilot program begun in 2016 by Dow and Reynolds. It's this joint effort. And they began by calling it a plastics recycling program. So they launched on Earth Day and, you know, part of a, a long history of corrupting the, the genuine uh, uh, origin of Earth Day. And basically, their uh, project is supposed to deal with the unrecyclable plastic waste. And so the people of Omaha, the first city where it was rolled out, were given these orange bags and told, put your uh, plastic in these orange bags and we'll recycle them. Well, it turns out, again, that the, the first place they went, or one of the first places, was an incinerator that had Clean Air Act violations. But it was also to sell hefty bags. Well, yes. These the are orange, plastic bags. You know, yes. We're using—yes. One of many <laughs> ways in which we're basically creating more plastic as a solution to the plastics problem. So they did stop sending uh, to the kiln incinerator, but they've done a number of other ill-fated um, projects with the plastic. Some of it has been reformed into fence posts and uh, decks, which sounds like a really good idea um, at first. But it turns out, and I talked to some chemists and biologists about this for the story, that the um, toxic additives that are in many plastics are then in the recycled products, so that we don't know enough about these things, and sometimes we do know that they're dangerous to put them in a deck that you're going to sit your children on or sit yourself on um, or onto roads. Another thing they're talking about, it means a perpetuation of, of the release of the toxic substances. You also write about the myth of chemical recycling. Explain. <sighs> yeah. So this is the latest. Uh, the latest sort of big push by the American Chemistry Council and other plastic makers about how we can recycle our way out of this mess. And I'm going to say, put some quotes around recycling, because, again, this is um, not exactly what it seems at first, because it does seem like a great idea, right? If we could just reuse this and it would be circular, that's wonderful. Um, so the idea is they have sort of two different uh, methods, pyrolysis and gasification. But the idea broadly is to heat up these plastics and then from that uh, extract some waste, uh, sorry, some fuel or wax or some other usable product, which 
it sounds great, except we don't actually know how to do this yet in any uh, economically feasible way or to remove the additives that I just talked about, those toxic, toxic additives. So this idea has been kicking around for about 30 years. And uh, in the past few years, all the attempts or, or most of the attempts to actually get these things off the ground have failed before they even uh, open their doors, because there isn't a way to make them economically feasible. And in part, that's because the cost of energy right now, the fossil fuels like natural gas, is almost nothing. So in the end, you're going to try to produce a fuel that's going to compete with a very cheap fuel. But in the meantime, you're taking basically a fossil fuel product, which is plastic. You're using fossil fuels to uh, truck it to the pyrolysis plant, then to destroy it, right? And then to create an additional fossil fuel. When I tried to ask folks at these plants, uh, well, what is the, um, how much plastic do you need to make how much fuel? Nobody told me. They dodged my questions. And you can actually see the leaders of this uh, movement within in industry, some of the biggest proponents, have openly acknowledged that we don't know how to do this yet. They don't know how to do it. They say sometime in the future, we're, we're aiming for it. But meanwhile, even though we don't know how to do this yet, six states have passed laws that are facilitating these chemical recycling facilities. Some of them actually explicitly lessen, weaken the air pollution restrictions, so they will be able to basically heat and essentially burn plastics and reduce some of the toxic uh, and release some of the toxic emissions under these new laws. Can you talk about what's happening at the EPA? Um, and the massive deregulation that's going on. The most recent story is chlorpyrifos. Mm. Um, so chlorpyrifos is a, a perfect example of how dysfunctional and, and actually how uh, exactly the opposite of what should be done the current EPA is doing. Now, chlorpyrifos is an organophosphate pesticide. It's been its dangers have been well known for years, and in fact, there was a push to um, ban it uh, in 2000, and that's because we knew even back then that it was affecting the uh, neurodevelopment of children. Uh, it was killing. Uh, some people who were poisoned by it in large amounts, and the evidence was already emerging that that even at very low uh, exposure levels, it was affecting how children develop. Um, so in 2000, they did manage to restrict it from home use, but it remained on the market for agriculture. And it took many years uh, of work within the EPA and lawsuits against the EPA by Earth Justice and others to push uh, the EPA forward with regulating it and actually removing it from the market. There was a decision in 2015 to essentially do that. Uh, and the process, uh, you know, is, is slow. And in 2016, it was all teed up to go. But there was a comment period, right? And the comment period uh, was expected by those who expected Hillary to win the election to be a formality. And then, in fact, the EPA would go ahead and, as promised, and as their the science and the report said it must, uh, ban the pesticide. And exactly the opposite happened, as we now know. Um, and, of course, the farmers are affected by this as well. Yes, absolutely. The folks in the, the farmers' families. Well, it's, it's the folks in agricultural communities who have really laid out exactly why it's harmful. There's an amazing study in California where they have great autism records and great pesticide use records, and folks have combined them and were able to show that exposure to chlorpyrifos in the second trimester of pregnancy uh, resulted in uh, three times the level of kids with autism. So basically, if you had a, a kid uh, and you were exposed, the chances that that kid had autism were three times elevated if you were exposed.
I want to also finally ask you about um, your incredible work on Teflon and what's happening right now. You wrote the series called The Teflon Toxin. Uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services uh, did a study that found that the chemicals PFOA and PFOS, which are used in Teflon and firefighting foam, are unsafe for human health as at levels as little as one-tenth of the amount the EPA previously called safe. Now, we're talking about chemicals that are particularly found, among other places, around military bases, the Pentagon using foams containing these chemicals in exercises at military bases nationwide. What has happened around this issue? Well, and tell us about exactly what those chemicals okay, yeah. are. Yeah, so PFOA is an industrial chemical. It's most famous. We call it the Teflon toxin because DuPont used it when it was making Teflon. And that was sort of the big uh, explosion of its use. It was introduced in the 1940s by 3M, which sold it to DuPont. And uh, it's been, it's funny because it's called, and it's thought of as an emerging contaminant, as something that, you know, we're just beginning to understand. But it's actually been around, and some people have understood it for decades, understood that it was uh, contaminating water in many, many places, that very low levels can have health effects, and that it remains in the human body, uh, can accumulate there. And the other thing that's really terrifying about this chemical is that it doesn't go away, which is why people call it forever chemical. So it doesn't degrade in the environment on its own. So decades, this has been, quote unquote, emerging. And over the past four years, it's really been heartening that finally there is some movement on this. And so we did see really exciting pushes in Congress and this recognition, uh, finally, by the regulatory agencies, particularly EPA, that something needs to be done. Um, that said, the folks who are being exposed to it will tell you uh, that it's not enough. You talked about the level. I was at a conference a month or two ago with the head of the NIEHS, who actually said that the safe level That's for the National me, Institute of, of Environmental, Environmental Health. Health Sciences, and she was saying that the safe a safe level for PFOA should actually be 0.1 parts per trillion, and the current level at EPA is 70. So that's 700 times lower. And she was basing wow. this on studies that her uh, branch of government had done on rats that showed the very level, low levels of this chemical produce uh, pancreatic tumors and cancers. So I uh, published her—we did publish her a link to that research, which I think is really important. Uh, but I think that we're going to see the level go down and down and down as we get more science. And some people have said there is not a safe level. I can see why they would make that argument. But can I say one more—one important thing to realize about the, these chemicals is that we are focusing on PFOA and PFOS. Because they're the best known at this point. And, and PFOA is, is known again because of DuPont and this huge litigation that uh, happened in West Virginia against them. PFOS, which is made by 3M, is a major ingredient in firefighting foam. But there are actually thousands of chemicals in this class, and none of them degrade. And as we have been voluntarily phasing out PFOA and PFOS, the industry has been phasing in replacements that are also persistent, that also accumulate, and that also are, as we begin to study them, show that also have similar problems uh, with health. Finally, I wanted to get your comment on this. The Trump-Pence campaign website offering a pack of 10 Trump-branded red plastic straws for $15 <laughs> alongside a caption reading, liberal paper straws don't work. Politico reports the first batch sold out within hours and that the straws have raised nearly a half million dollars for Trump's re-election bid. Yeah. I mean, there— they're not even theoretically recyclable, and if it gives them joy to, you know, put plastic into sea animals, you know, into, into the world, it's, it's waste.
Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us, Sharon Lerner, journalist who covers health and environment for The Intercept, reporting fellow at Type Investigations. We'll link to her series, The Teflon Toxin. It was a finalist for a National Magazine Award, as well as her latest piece, Waste Only, How the Plastics Industry is Fighting to Keep Polluting the World. It published again in The Intercept in partnership with Type Investigations. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.